Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So our first point, we focus on the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, we look at the triumph. During that difficult trial, our Lord triumphed. What was it that made him triumph? We want to explore that. So trial, triumph, and then finally, we turn the whole passage to ourselves. And my third point would be the tragedy of many a disciple. So what the Lord discovered when on trial was that his disciples who were told to watch did not watch. In fact, they fell asleep. They did not pray either. So neither watchful nor prayerful. Instead, they fell asleep. So the picture of the disciples present to us the tragedy of many a human being, especially Christians or disciples of the Lord. So these are the three points we're looking at. The trial, the triumph, and then finally, the tragedy. Let's look at the trial of the Lord. As I was uh, meditating while the service was going on, there was this picture that was shown about our Lord kneeling down and facing heaven. And I couldn't help but think of the words that is found in Mark's gospel. And there in verse 35, the Lord say, if it were possible. Let's consider these words once more. The Lord asking His Father, Abba, if it were possible. Now, this word speaks volumes, you know. Why? Because what we know of our Lord is this. He is consistently unflappable. When He met Satan, on trial again, tempted, he knew how to answer, unflappable, totally prepared, not moved at all. And when they crossed the Sea of Galilee and the storm was brewing and the disciples were frightened to bits, our Lord was unflappable, in fact, asleep in the boat. It seems nothing moved him, you know. And yet, here, in this very incident, we hear these words, if it were possible. What do these words mean? In our ordinary language, when we ask a question with, if it were possible, we're really asking for an option, an alternative. Is there another way? So why should our Lord be asking whether is there another option? It must be because the trial that He is experiencing is indeed very tremendous. And that is why Mark tells us this place is called Gethsemane. Not just Mark, John also. And what is Gethsemane? The Aramaic word Gethsemane means olive press. So today when you go on your Holy Land tour, they take you to this orchard of olive trees, right? And they believe that that was Gethsemane. And I think that's what they're right. But an olive press means this. It refers not to the trees. It refers not to the wonderful shade that you can get. It refers to a device that is used for pressing olives. And this is very similar to the experience our Lord was going through. 
He felt as though he was between the vices or the jaws of a press coming down upon him. And all the pressure of the press could be felt. And this is Gethsemane, the olive press. And spiritually, the Lord was experiencing it. So great it was that he now asked if it were possible. In fact, the next verse, if you look at it, those words are repeated but with a different key. Father, all things are possible with you. All things. Remove this cup. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So we must understand Gethsemane to be really the greatest trial of our Lord. So great it was that is asking the Father, is there another way? And that prompts a question. What is this trial that our Lord finds it so difficult that He finds Himself instinctively recoiling? Of course, you need to understand, our Lord is the incarnate Word of God, fully man. So the pressure would be felt by Him because He is the incarnate One. But what was it? What was precisely the thing that our Lord was recoiling from? Looking at Mark again, you find this to be said. Our Lord said, if it were possible, take this cup away from me. So He's asking the Father, is there another way which does not involve my drinking of the cup? Why is the Lord recoiling from the idea of drinking from the cup? Now in Scripture, cup usually means judgment. Of course, it can mean a decisive moment, but usually judgment. And this helps us to understand what the trial was. The trial did not come from Satan because that the Lord Jesus can handle very easily. The trial did not come from human beings, from Pilate, from the Jewish leaders. Nothing. The trial that our Lord faces here is very, very different from all these other disturbances. That trial is the cup of the wrath of God. The cup of the wrath of God. The Lord knew in order to save us, the way the Father has designed must be for Him to bear the wrath of God. And this makes it so poignant so paradoxical in some ways. Here you have our Lord talking to God using the most intimate term, Abba, Abba. Is it possible for this cup of wrath to be taken away from me? And later on, when you read Paul, not only is this the cup of wrath, the cup also means the Lord's identification with sin. Now what do I mean by that? In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul writes that Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us. So the cup is the wrath of God because our Lord will be carrying our sins. Not only was He carrying our sins, it's as though He is sin. All our sins fell upon Him so that He is sin. It is this cup of wrath that is poured up on sin which our Lord now is recoiling from. And that's the trial. And that's the trial. Is there another way? Is there another way to save us? Of course, you will discover and the Lord will teach, there is no other way. For the old creation like us to be redeemed must mean that the wrath of God must be satisfied fully by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that must also mean that our Lord would have to bear our sins. It is at this point words fail me. That's why the picture was so important. What was going on there? The trial they experience is not like any ordinary trial. The wrath of God directed at sin. Now in His ministry, our Lord is known as the Holy One. He's known as the sinless one. But He knows very soon He will be bearing our sin. And very soon he will be saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the cup he would have to drink. A cup no one else can drink except him. Because no one else is worthy to carry our sins except our Lord Jesus Christ. And here, if I may just say something to my audience here. None of us like trials. Let's face it. 
I mean, if we like trials, there's something wrong with us. We need to examine our, you know, our head. None of us like trials. And that the surprising thing is that sometimes these trials come from the Father Himself. And we find it very hard to understand. God, if you are my Father, if you are Abba, why do these trials come to me? If you thought like that, you're not alone. Just look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He was Abba Father He was talking to. And there was no other way. The cup must be given and the cup must be drunk. That is the trial he faced. Given that trial now, how did our Lord meet it? We come now to our second point. And here our Lord said this. So please appreciate fully what the Lord said. If it were possible, Father, all things are possible. Let this cup pass. And he didn't end there. He goes on to say, yet not what I will, but what you will. Those words signify the triumph of the Lord over the trial. Yet not what I will, but what you will. How are we to unpack this triumph? Firstly, those words mean that our Lord now will submit Himself to the Father. He could see, based on His holiness, that that is not something that He would normally want to do. But then he said, not my will, but yours be done. The submission of our Lord Jesus to the Father's will, even if it meant his bearing of people's sin, even if it meant his becoming sin and his drinking of the cup of the wrath of God. Not my will, but yours be done. And that's Monday, Thursday. Our Lord stooping to wash the disciples is only part one. To fulfill that, He must go to the cross. And He says, not my will, but yours, Lord, be done. So, the overcoming of this greatest trial is that of submitting oneself to God. And that speaks volumes to us today as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ in this very difficult world. If we trust God, if we have faith in God, then it must be that we have to learn to submit ourselves to God. If we find submission to God difficult, it will only mean that we don't trust God. If we say, Lord, your plan not so good. Huh? <laughs> Mine's better. That's why I cannot follow you. But if we really think it's all wise, all good, then we learn to submit ourselves to God. And this leads my mind to think of that interesting incident that the Lord had with one of the uh, interlocutors, a rich young man, asking to follow the Lord. And this rich young man say, good master, you know, tell me how to get eternal life, right? And the Lord said, why do you call me good? Only one is God, God is good. And then after that, the Lord ran through all the commandments and then finally say, well, sell all that you have and follow me. And the young man couldn't do it. The question is, why did the Lord go through all this rigmarole of talking about good, only God is good, then what are the commandments, sell all the gift, you know, and, and then uh, come and follow me? Well, it all is premised upon this. This person knows God is good. That's his confession of faith. Our God is good. And the Lord said, yeah, correct. Sell all you have now and follow me. And he couldn't do it. That means he's saying, Maybe not so good now. Eh? My definition of good is different. <laughs> My definition of good is that I'll keep something for myself. Give all this and they follow you. If he really understood God is good, he say, yes, Lord, what you ask of me is also for my good. But that was what he couldn't get. That's why what you ask of me, I don't want to do it. Because now he's saying, what you ask of me is really not good for me. And thereby contradicting his idea of God is good. And sometimes they're like that too. I mean, we come to church, we confess, God is good. Yes, He is. But when the Lord asks us to do something outside our comfort zone, <laughs> no. So, are we really saying God is good? If we are, we submit ourselves and follow the Lord. So, that's one thing we see. In overcoming the greatest of trial, our Lord submitted Himself because He knows the Father's will is the best and it is good. But there's a second thing we see. 
It is during prayer that these words are, were uttered. It was during prayer that the Lord spoke the words of submission. So therefore, we cannot forget the importance of prayer. Let me try to put it as clearly as I can. To say, Lord, we submit ourselves to you is easy. Done within a great company, it is even easier. But when it comes to submission to God over things that are most precious to us, things that we find it very hard to let go, that kind of submission can only be achieved through the agony of prayer. Because it is during prayer that we really face ourselves. It is during prayer that we're not looking at one another now. No more pretense where we are really grappling with all the desires of our heart. And it is in that kind of context that we learn, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And this has a spin on If we find it so hard to submit to God, then we need to learn from this passage and see that it is through prayer that we learn to utter the genuine needs of, the genuine words of submission. How? Before God. Of course, prayer is also asking for requests. That we know. But prayer also means agonizing. There we pour before God all our desires, maybe all our even thoughts, even, evil thoughts, eh? and all our maybe quest to find loopholes and escape ports. And in that context, we talk to God. We hear God speak to us. And then we respond and say, no, 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 cannot, no, cannot, cannot be done. Cannot be done. It, it's taking too much out of me. Then the Lord will let us go and back and forth and back and forth until finally we see the light. Until finally we understand. And then we say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. This kind of victory can only be achieved by prayer. And similarly for, for our Lord, similarly for our Lord, it was at the Garden of Gethsemane and during prayer, that he said, not my will, but yours be done. And that has something to tell us in our Christian practice today in our society. We, are, we find it very hard to pray. If the church organizes events to reach out to the poor, neighborhood, celebrating events, people come in droves. Praise God for that. And I, please don't misunderstand. Keep coming, keep coming. It's a great thing. But when we organize prayer meeting, very hard. We drag our feet. Thank God we drag our feet. Some don't even drag their feet. They put up their feet at home and rest. It's good to drag your feet to come. I never look down, and your pastors don't. Never look down on people dragging their feet to church. Praise God they're here. Like I said, some don't even come. Why? Because we instinctively know prayer can be agonizing. And not just instinctively, but also humanly, many of us find it hard to pray. It's so hard to pray. Pastor, I can sweep the floor. Come to prayer with it very hard. But it is during prayer, really during prayer, that we come to see ourselves truly agonize over ourselves with the help of God and then overcome all these problems. Two points have been made. First, the trial. Don't ever forget that it was a great trial. So great it was that our Lord said, if it were possible. And the trial was overcome by our Lord's submission of Himself to God and done so through prayer. My final point, the tragedy. Here you have the Lord praying, preparing Himself for His greatest ordeal. He brought his disciples. Now take note, these were the inner three. You can say the Ta Si Xiong, the top-notch disciples, the cream of the crop, right? The inner three. They were with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. They see things that other disciples did not. The cream of the crop was brought by the Lord. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, they were told to watch and pray. And instead of watching and praying, they fell asleep. And our Lord told them, it is only by watching and prayer that temptation can be overcome. 
we won't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The disciples' picture, or the picture of the disciples, is that of failure, tragic failure. And in the disciples, we can see ourselves. You see, many things are happening in our world today at very, very rapid pace. Really very rapid. And how are we to react? If we understand this passage well, we must learn to watch. Very often, we are taken along for a ride by the world, you know. We don't have that discernment to watch. But after watching, we need to pray. Now, watching is very important. Watching with the wisdom of God. Because if we don't watch with the wisdom of God, we can become complicit with the evil of the world. Take, for example, in our world today, many of us, and we have friends who are like that, aspire to have high salaries. And high salaries mean certain jobs, like banking, being a doctor, or being a lawyer. And all these are rosy in terms of the salaries they pay us. Until you learn to scratch a little bit further, and then you realize that this comes with a price. Thank God, not all the time, but often they do. A price that asks us sometimes to sacrifice our principles on the altar of temporary gain. And there are many who have done so. And when we do that, we are actually perpetuating the evil of the world. But if we don't, we lose out. Yes, some of us may lose out. And then in our scales now, we put losing out in this world in terms of salary is far, far worse than losing out in terms of not getting eternal goods. You see, our whole set of values, system of values are all topsy-turvy. We have failed to watch. And sometimes, we also support certain programs in our world, certain protests even, and we fail to watch. And we end up perpetuating certain evil. Our Lord tells us, living in this world can be really tricky. We must learn to watch. But to watch properly must also mean we need to pray. Pray. Asking the Lord for strength. Many of the evils we see in our world today cannot be overcome just by good arguments or by uh, what they call counter-programs. A lot of these are through prayer. If you ask me, and pardon me, uh, your pastor never asked me to say this, I just said it myself. When I look at what is happening in the West, how notions of gender are changing and changing rapidly. It all began with a small group, spread like wildfire, taking in so many in the West. And I ask myself, how can it be? Those people who are really affected are just a small group of people. And yet, it's spread far and wide, having tentacles now all over the world, big companies, big organizations, all over the world. What's going on? What's going on? Some of my friends tell me it is a spiritual battle. And if they are right, then ever the more, we need to watch and pray. This kind of battle cannot be overcome just by numbers. Cannot be overcome just by good arguments. A lot of prayer and watching are needed. Because in prayer, we may find that the solution we present to the world is not what people think should be the, world, the solution. It may be that in prayer, our lives are transformed. And by the transformation of our lives, we now present not arguments, but an alternative that is convincing, authentic, and efficacious. And that must start with ourselves and not with clever arguments. And all this will come about only by watching and praying. And by watching and praying, we learn to submit ourselves to God. And as I think about submitting ourselves to God, 
I can't help but think of your pastoral team. I'm sure many of them went through this. When they heard the call of God to full-time ministry, I'm sure some of them prayed, if it were possible, Father, remove this cup from me. Lord, if there is an alternative for me to serve you, maybe as an LCEC member, ushering, Lord, I'll do that, I'll do that. And I'm sure they would have agonized over it. Lord, is there another way? Why must it be this way and this way? Is there another way? And then, willy-nilly, through the Lord's leading, they discover that is the way. And they learn to submit themselves and say, not my will, but yours be done. Perhaps that may be what the Lord may be saying to some of us tonight. Not your will, but God the Father, His will be done. Perhaps you've been agonizing over some matter that you have promised the Lord. Or the Lord may be touching you, prompting you to do. Yes, let us learn like our Lord. Not my will, but yours be done. So far, my sermon has been rather dark, I think. Frightening themes. Trials, triumphs, overcoming of will, submitting ourselves to God. But let me end on this note, a very important note. Back to Mark chapter 8, where the Lord told the disciples, if anyone were to come after me, he must take up, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And then he goes on to say, he who saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for the gospel's sake will find it. Now, our Lord is asking us to follow Him, deny ourselves, and take up the cross. In so doing, we learn to give our lives away. That's very frightening. Hang on, in case you misunderstand me. Life and love cannot be taken. It is God's gift. But life and love can be given Try it again. No one has the right to take my life and my love. But because of what the Lord has done and because of what I understand, eternal life to be, I happily give my life and my love. And this is what the passage in chapter 8 is all about. We learn to give our lives. And in so doing, we don't lose, we gain. But when we don't give and when we want to save it, we end up losing and not gaining. Let's, I know it's a bit theological, but let's use a final example. Past time ending soon. Let's think of this geog geography here, yeah? the land of Israel, where you have one main river called the River Jordan. You're familiar with that, right? River Jordan flowing from north to south. And as the river flows, it empties itself into two bodies of water, two lakes. The one to the north is called the Sea of Galilee. So Jordan River flows down, empties itself into the Sea of Galilee, then leaves the Sea of Galilee, flows further down south, and empties itself into the Dead Sea. Two bodies of water. One is full of life, Sea of Galilee, where over many millennia, fishing, fish, all this supported many generations of people. Full of life. That's the Sea of Galilee. You guys have tried it, right? The tilapia that they call St. Peter's. We use tilapia, by the way. But wonderful tilapia. Really tasty. That's the Sea of Galilee. Teeming with life. And the other lake is called the Dead Sea. No life. No fish. How is it that one river could give rise to two very different types of bodies of water? In fact, they're diametrically opposed. One full of life, one is utterly dead. Yet, and yet, one river. And the answer must be this. The Sea of Galilee receives water and also gives water. Receives and gives. And that's why the water always remains fresh. The 
sought content does not go up because it receives and it gives. The Dead Sea receives, it doesn't give. But although it doesn't give, yet it evaporates away. So, over time, the salt content goes up and finally it gets so salty, it cannot support life. And that's a very good parable of what the Christian life should be or should avoid. We receive from God life gifts. As we receive, we must happily give away. And in so doing, we will always remain fresh. But if we end up like the Dead Sea, receive and not give. Maybe the Hokkien phrase is the best. Kiam siap, you know. You receive, kiam ting kiam. So that's what happens. You receive, you don't give. The salt content goes out. And at the end of the day, you become a dead pool of water. Like I said, the Dead Sea is like those people who want to keep, but they realize even though they try to keep, they're losing through evaporation. We get old. We get a bit senile in time to come. We lose our gifts. We still lose it. But, and we lose, we're not giving. It's just loss. So instead of losing, why not give? And that's our goal. So back to what I want to say for Monday, Thursday. Our Lord told the disciples to follow Him. And He taught us these things about receiving and giving. And why did the Lord go to the cross? To save us, yes. Great ordeal, yes. But Hebrews tell us this. He went to the cross for the joy of the cross. He despised the shame. It was an ordeal, no doubt. Tasting the wrath of God, no doubt. Yes, being identified as in, no doubt. But the Lord also saw beyond all this was the salvation of human beings. And for that joy, He despised the shame of the cross. Similarly for us. Yes, some of us have to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. It's tough, Lord, really tough. But may the Lord help you to see beyond that to the joy. The joy of helping someone the joy of giving your life to someone so that that someone would thrive. The joy of leading someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. So at the end, if you ask your pastors, they say, we came. We came. Not in the way the world understands, but we came. And the same opportunity of gaining for eternity is open to all of us. Let us learn that to give our lives. And when we do that, let us learn to pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And that's Monday, Thursday. Tough. Very tough. But at the end, we see the joy that the Lord had in saving us. And because of that, we are all here gathered together today in commemoration of the event of Monday, Thursday, and the Garden of Gethsemane. And those gathered here today are not just people in transients. No, they will live forever with our God. And so great is this gathering that I'm sure angels in heaven would rejoice when they see God's people like you and me gathering to remember Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Monday, Thursday, Garden of Gethsemane, the greatest ordeal of our Lord. Oh Lord, let all this sink into our hearts. Lest we forget Gethsemane, lest we forget your agony. Let all these things sink in. And as they sink in, Lord, help us now catch a gleam and be touched once more by your love. I said once more, not just once more like those other times when we were touched, but once more with greater depth, greater impact, open our eyes to understand and see how much you love us, Lord. That you, Lord, would finally drink the cup 
of the wrath of your Father for us. That you, Lord, would not just carry our sins, but be the sin so that all our sins will be taken away. All this was done so that we unworthy ones may not just only be saved, but to be with you for all eternity. And also to discover in a very strange way that we can follow your example by giving our lives away. Yes, Lord, before us are two possibilities, to lose our life or to give our life. Let us choose the right way to give our life. Because ultimately, if we don't, we will also lose it and we will gain nothing. Let us give so that we may gain not just friends, not just a family of God's people, but gain more souls for your kingdom. And that would mean winning someone for you for all eternity. Let this be our joy and calling. And if there be some tonight who are specially touched by you and hearing you calling him to serve you with greater depth and fervor, Lord, may he answer yes. May you continue to touch him so that he too may be wonderfully blessed by you. Use us as a church. Use us as your witness in this part of Singapore. May your name be glorified and may we be blessed. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.